Good morning, Bethany Baptist Church. Mike Russell from the Hope Sunday School class with our day's lesson, Committed to His Worship. Uh, we hope you're going to enjoy this. Uh, I am. I, I've really enjoyed uh, coming from the book of Psalms today. We're going to be looking at Psalms 99, verses 1 through 9. And our point of emphasis is going to be God deserves our worship and praise. And before we get started, we'll have a, a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for our life. We thank you for our opportunity to come to your house one more time and worship you and give you praise and honor. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for our administrative staff here at Bethany. We thank you for those individuals that are support personnel here and all that they do to make our worshiping a lot easier and comfortable to praise your holy name. Our God and protectors is going to be our prayer. Amen. Uh, we got to look at Psalms 99 today. And before we get to talking about Psalms 99 verses 1 through 9, I want to say that this season that we are in, the Thanksgiving season, we thank God for all of the good things that he has bestowed upon us. Uh, good things in our lives like jobs and homes and cars and and we just express gratitude for the things but do we express gratitude for the one that gives us these things the good God uh, we should look at changing our focus from what God does to who God is and today we're going to look at the goodness and the and the love that he gives us each and every day. Uh, I said we're going to be looking at Psalms 99 verses 1 through 9, but we also have to understand that this set of Psalms, uh, Psalms 47, 93, 96 through 99, are all called enthronement Psalms. And we're going to find that these enthronement psalms uh, have a verse in them that lead us to that God reigns. In Psalms 99.1, 98.1, 96.10, and Psalms 97.1 all have that common theme that the Lord reigns. Uh, we're going to look at the holiness of Christ, I mean of God, and his his aspect of worshiping him. And as we worship him, and we must understand that we only can worship God in two ways. That is in spirit and in truth. But we are going to also look at the holiness and the sovereignty of God in this theme of Psalms 99. So we understand that regardless of how we look at it, this Psalms, we can look at this Psalms being divided in three sections. Uh, his explanation of God's holiness. We're going to describe his might and his righteousness and his character and his grace for forgiveness. Uh, in Psalms 99, the Psalm also declares that God observes our worship, deserves our worship and praise. And when we try to worship for the sake of certain benefits that may be covered, the act ceases to be worship. And for them, it attempts to use God as a means of something else. So let's get into the lesson here today. We're going to read all of Psalms, and then we're going to break it into uh, the different categories in which it, uh, the, the verses fall. In 99... Psalms 99.1, it reads, The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. The king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou don't lovest equity. Thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. 
for he is holy. Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among them that call upon his name. They called upon the Lord and he answered them. He spoke unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. Thou answerest them, O Lord our God, thou wast a God that forgivest them. Through thy tuckest vengeance of thy inventions, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of his holy word this morning. Well, let's go back and look at it. The Lord reigneth. Let the people tremble. He said it between the cherubims. See, God is enthroned between the cherubims means that more than angels attend to him. See, God instructed the people in building the ark of the, of the covenant. And when he built the ark of the covenant, he gave them instructions, just like he gave Noah instructions about building the ark. He gave them instructions about building the ark of the covenant. And they said that the ark of the covenant is where God reigned with them and they carried the ark with them throughout the wilderness and into the promised land. If you take your Bible and go to Exodus 25, 22, we see that God told them that he will meet the high priest there. And there in 22, it says, and there I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat and from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testament. Moni. And of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. See, we see that God reigneth means to ascend to the throne and become king. And we see that the Lord is king and sovereign one. It's the only one that is sovereign. And does the Lord reign in our lives? If, we not, if not, we must come to realize who and what does. For we all allow something to rule us, even our own selfish desires. Man was made to worship. And it said that the Lord sitteth between the cherubims. Well, we see a lot of that cherubim described in Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel 10, where the cherubims were twain. And as these cherubims set, God instructed them when they made that Ark of the Covenant that the two angels would be facing one another. And he would be sitting on the throne. And it says in the last part of that verse that let the people tremble and let the earth be moved. That people means nations. And he was talking about the nation of what? Israel. And it goes on that other nations, people, from God's reputation, begin to see God in a different light that he was not just a regional God. He was not just a God of the Israelites. He became gods of those others. And the others came into two categories. Either you were a Jew or you were what? A Gentile. And so God's reputation among his own people caused other nations to exalt him as well. Well, he is above all people. He is to be lifted up and exalted. And being exalted by all nations, uh, we see that Christianity and has grown. And as it has grown throughout the world, it is still growing. So God is being, his reputation is among other people and causes other nations to exalt him as well. And we have to praise that God. And we have to remember that the great and terrible name terrible name. That doesn't mean that we are afraid of God. 
It means that we should give him fear and reverence and honor. Uh, you know, I, I used to tell the Hope Sunday Scout School class all the time about my grandmother, my mother's mother, that when it rained or thunderstorm came up, you had to sit still and, and let God's work be done. Uh, you didn't have the television on. You didn't uh, move around. You sat and patiently and quietly while the thunderstorms came. Uh, that was her pet pee at her house. And we had to abide by that and we learned to fear the Lord and let the Lord work. Uh, it says that the Lord is holy. So that when we praise the great and terrible name, we praise him because he is holy. And holy means that God is set apart. And he take on the quality of purity because that is the character of God. So let's look at what this. The Lord reigns, the Lord is great, the Lord is holy, and the Lord must be praised. In verses 4 through 5, we see the king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou don't thus establish equity, thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt you the Lord our God and worship his footstool for he is holy. Well, when we look at the word Jacob, righteousness in Jacob, he's talking about Israel. And all God has done for the people and his persistent righteousness is being exalted here. Exalt ye the Lord, praise him, and worship his footstool. Well, how do we expect establish equity? Well, the, the psalmist affirms that the Lord does not show posh, partiality in his dealings. And he when he doesn't do that, we can count on being consistent when we deal with God. Even if we do not understand how it is, we know that what he does and allows will work toward his purpose and can be used for his best interest. You know, we say all the time that God's ways, we don't understand because we have to learn to do it things his way. Uh, his way is sometime beyond our understanding, but yet it always works out for the people. And we must understand that it's our attention as people to continue to worship him. Uh, he is just and righteous in nature, and he cannot do otherwise because he is what? He is holy. And so, therefore, we should exalt him, lift him up, the Lord our God, and worship at his footstool. And this word footstool is, is used variously in the Old Testament. Uh, sometimes when we talk about the footstool, we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant where God was supposed to be with the people as they went from place to place and put in the tent. The footstool could be the temple on Mount Zion. It could be the city that is called Jerusalem. And God's footstool can be the whole earth because he reigns in what? In heaven. And the worshiping congregation must bow down before God whose holiness is manifested in his righteousness. Well, in Isaiah 5.16 it says, but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. So let's look at this. The mighty king intervenes in our lives as his people and acting impartially, justly, and righteously. And we as his people respond to him in humility and worship and declaration of his holiness. So in verses 6 through 8, well, let's see, 6 through 9, we see that Moses and Aaron and his priests and Samuel among them call upon his name. They call upon the Lord and he answered them. He spoke unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. 
Thou answers them, O Lord our God, thou wast a God that forgivest them. Through thou tookest vengeance on their inventions. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Well, he, met, he mentioned, the psalmist mentioned Moses, Aaron, and Samuel. They were all great leaders. And these great leaders constantly in Exodus, we see, was going before the Lord, asking and making appeals to the Lord on behalf of the people. And as they interceded for them during their rebellious period, God continually forgave them and, and led them. Notice that they said that he led by a pillar, this pillar cloud. He's talking about in the wilderness when he had a pillar over them, of cloud over them at night, I mean in the day, to keep them from burning up in the hot sun, and a pillar of fire at night to keep them warm. Uh, God continued to, to be amongst them. See, the Lord is attentive to, to the cries of his people. Even at times we think he does not hear us or be with us. And that is a good example of the poem, Footsteps in the Sand, where the sand, uh, you saw two pill, uh, sets of footprints. And then when it got rocky and, and uh, thorny, uh, we find that it was only one set of footprints. And he was saying, Lord, I thought you was going to be with me through all of this. And he says, why is it when I got to the rocky part of my life, there is only one set of footprints? And the Lord told him, that's when I picked you up and carried you. So God is continually being there for us, even when we are not attentive to uh, our own selves, and he hears our cries. And so we see that however uh, we look at it, God is continually being there for us, even when we are rebellious. Now Samuel, on the other hand, was going to the tabernacle in the temple and finding what the Lord wanted the people to uh, be and do and get the instructions from God. And he would also intercede for those people and the direction for his counsel of the nation. See, the Lord is not limited in the way that he responds to us because remember, the Lord have all of the resources that he needs at his disposal to see about his children. And if he doesn't have them, somebody else have them, and he'll make them do what he wants them to do. Uh, notice all the resources that he had with Pharaoh in getting Pharaoh to let his people go. Now, God's testimonies, they, they kept his testimonies. They mean... Moses, Aaron, and Samuel. And his testimonies are his precepts and statutes and decrees. And his, the Lord's testimonies are true, reliable, accurate, just any faithful witness should be. And we see that as we move through and look at Aaron, Moses, and Samuel, they were faithful also. They were not perfect, but they were faithful. And we're not perfect. No one has been perfect but Jesus. Uh, even when we f are at our worst, God still forgives us. Uh, he Yet God punishes us, but he always forgives. And God never holds our past sins against us. And so the vengeance of his inventions is to avenge, to punish. Uh, think about the punishments that we had coming up as children when our parents raised us and the punishments that we had to give to our children to make them do and tolerate the things that they're supposed to do that is correct, uh, correcting them. And see, the Lord takes our sin seriously. He takes forgiveness just as seriously as he does the sin. 
such may be incomprehensible to us, but it is true to the character of the Lord God. And it says that we should exalt the God, the Lord our God, and worship at his holy hill. And this holy hill is, is really the footstool. Footstool mentioned that we mentioned in verse 5, called his holy mountain. And whenever we encounter the holiness of God, it is a location appropriate for worship. See, the Lord answers those who call on his name. The Lord provides instruction and guidance to his people in various ways. The Lord holds people accountable for their sin, but he also extends what? Forgiveness. God's people have cause to worship. Worship him as the Holy One. So let's recap here a moment and look at Psalms 99. God is holy, and Psalms 99 affirms this holiness. And his powerful reign, the righteousness of his justice, and the grace that which he responds when we call him. Secondly, holiness is a daily pursuit, affecting our attitudes, our behavior, and our relationships. We have to show, live a life that is holy. How, we can't talk about it. We have to go out and do it. Because it says our attitudes, our behavior, and our relationship with each other should be in a holy manner. And finally, our awareness of such holy and glorious God ought to drive us to fall on our knees in worship to him. But we understand that there will become a time when every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord and so at that, we're going to stop and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson today on your holiness and your righteousness and your opportunity to give us guidance in our daily lives. Father, we just want to thank you for this lesson today. We thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you just one more time in your tabernacle, Lord Heavenly Father. And Father, we pray for those individuals that are sick. We pray for those individuals that are going through treatments and surgeries, Lord Heavenly Father. We pray a special manner for all of those individuals. Father, we just want to thank you and praise your holy name for all that you do for each and every one of us. Guide and protect us through this Thanksgiving season, O oh, Heavenly Father, and we will give you all the honor, praise, and glory for what you have done and who you are. Not for what you have done so much, but for who you really are. The omnipotent one, O oh, Heavenly Father. The one and only God. The holy of holy. And these things we ask in your son Jesus. Amen.